What we learned from Ed Donatel's new defense, the Twins, dare I say, streaking? And Mike Zimmer has a new job. All that and more coming up next on Superior Sports Talk. Carol 11 sports anchor Reggie Wilson covers the Twin City sports scene nonstop. Luke Inman is ready to put him on the hot seat. That's what you're going to do to me. Instant analysis. Yanked. Out you go. Post game breakdowns and red hot takes. The Timberwolves need a stitch. Reggie and Luke give you a daily dose of Minnesota sports with Superior Sports Talk. Part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. And it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode, Superior Sports Talk, presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. That's Kara Levin's very own Reggie Wilson with me, so life is good. Happy hump day, Reg. Big show lined up, breaking down top things we glean from Ed Donatel's new 3-4 defense. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see some more wrinkles when the 49ers come to town today. Yes, sir. Remember, follow along on the Lockdown Minnesota YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button there. And on Twitter, give us a follow at Lockdown M-I-N. And remember, we're a podcast too, free and available on all platforms. Subscribe, drop us that five-star review. Take us everywhere on the go so you never miss any of the action. All right. To football we go. 21 days until week one of the NFL season kicks off. We're getting there, man. Can you believe it? Wow. Vikes practice yesterday. It was closed to the public. They now end training camp with just two practices with the 49ers. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. But first, I want to get into Ed Donatel's new 3-4 defense. You got to remember, Mike Zimmer was here for eight seasons a Mm -hmm. defensive savant, a mastermind. People may remember him for those last two seasons when they definitely struggled and dipped down a little bit, but he built some incredible Vikings defenses over the years. 2017 will always be the tip of the iceberg. Number one defense, broke so many records, broke the third down record that season. Limbaugh Joseph, Harrison Smith in his prime, Eric Kendricks, Anthony Barr, you name it. But It was also the same system and same scheme year after year after year. Never saw too many new wrinkles or looks, even towards the end. But Saturday, Vikings fans got their first look at a new defense for the first time in nearly a decade. So I want to get into, and I want to pick Reggie's brain a little bit, about some of the notable differences and changes we'll see in 2022 on that side of the ball. Reg, what's a few things that jumped out to you after watching Ed Donatel's defense versus a real opponent Saturday afternoon? So here was the thing, you know, Ed Donatel, Vic Fangio basically attached at the hip for the last like bajillion years. Right. And so, you know, Donatel comes over and when you look at like those Denver Bronco defenses, the 49ers defenses back when they were together there or when they were with the Bears together, you you notice things like, you know, those ball hawking defensive backs kind of putting them on islands, letting them do their thing. And and you notice, you know, guys standing up, rushing the passer, you know, guys like, you know, Von Miller getting a chance to rush the passer. Uh, you know, guys in in uh Chicago, you had Khalil Mack, you know, standing up, rushing the passer. And now you you kind of see like how this new defense with the Vikings is going to take shape with Zedarius on one side, Daniil on the other side. I liked how they got pressure just from some of the base fronts, which was exciting to see. You know, there was pressure from Harrison Smith, uh, Harrison Phillips, I should say, right up the middle. And so that was exciting as well. Like, I think the pieces that they got on defense this past uh, offseason to go into this year in this new scheme, in this new defense. You got some guys who are used to the 3-4, some guys who are getting reacquainted with it, and some guys that, you know, it's new to. But I think you have some good pieces in place to show that that they can do it do it at a high level. Now, I, I think what's interesting is, is, you know, Andrew Booth Jr. is a guy that you expect to be, you know, a lockdown corner one day. He's a little handsy. Just a little handsy, you know, putting him on an island back there against uh, some of the receivers. And I think that's going to be something that he'll learn and he'll grow into as he continue to get uh, get coached up. But that's something that you see in this in this new defense. They're going to give them some freedom. You know, I I think you did mention something about maybe a little bit more zone um, than maybe you saw 
with Zimmer. Maybe that that gives guys like Patrick Peterson a chance to just kind of roam an area and really just kind of lock down an area as opposed to just like picking up and running with the guy step for step. But I, I think it's pretty exciting just to see some of the differences, some of the the nuances going from, you know, Zimmer, that that cover two style, you know, base defense to now a, a three, four set. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think Vic Fangio's bread and butter has always been just this cover one look, which mm -hmm. you get one deep center field safety, could be Bynum, mm -hmm. could be Seen, could be Harry, and you leave both those cornerbacks out on an island. Now, if they can hold their own, it works beautifully because you put that exactly. extra safety up in the box. So you got an extra guy in run support. Maybe you can blitz. Maybe you can cover a, a tight end or a running back out of the flat. Gives you tons of options. But you got to have those good boundary cornerbacks. So that'll be a little bit of trial and error, I'm sure, these first few weeks. But a little bit more into the X's and O's I want to go. I snuck in some All-22 the very next day. And I got to say, it still feels really weird watching this base nickel defense for the first time and remember their base defense is a 3-4 but KOC and Ed Donatel basically both came out and said yeah it's a 3-4 but our base we're probably going to run more nickel than anything else more of the time so you've got just two down linemen two guys hand in the dirt we're used to seeing four over the last eight years with Mike Zimmer and even before that as well and then you've got these four linebackers bowed out wide so when you're watching this all 22 camera angle it just feels like the middle of the field is just wide open every play at the line of scrimmage mm. if they were to run a draw or a quarterback scramble up the gut just at first glance it feels really exposed and vulnerable because you've got five blockers O linemen versus two defenders at the line of scrimmage but then you get into the play and you see those linebackers stunt a lot, which means they start wide and they end up coming all the way back in the interior of the pocket. And then also, when you got two big bodies like Dalvin Tomlinson and Harrison Phillips, they just soak up a lot of extra attention and blockers. That allows those linebackers to roam free. They run around, make plays. Guys like Kendricks, Jordan Hicks, Brian Asamoa we saw. I think it's just a perfect fit for that personnel. The other thing that you can do in that nickel is offer different varieties and looks. So you can show your basic nickel with, like, say, Chandon Sullivan, an extra cornerback, but you can also show a big nickel with a third safety. And that's music to a lot of fans' ears because that's something we've been banging the table for all offseason. How do you get Harry, Bynum, and Lewis Seen, who would be that box safety or that box player, and use his physicality? How do you get all those guys on the field at the same time? So that big nickel look, that gets me the most jacked and excited after finding a way to get, again, your first-round pick on the field without having to take off Bynum, who just feels like a really good young playmaker. Let's switch gears here to quarterback for a second. Kirk Cousins announced he had COVID, what, last Thursday, misses the preseason game, doesn't travel with the team. Now we've got joint practices coming up in another preseason game Saturday. What's the update or word on the street? Because to be honest, I'm kind of in the dark here. I haven't heard much. Have you heard when his return is likely? And if we'll see him at any point, any portion of action when the Niners are in town these next few days? So Cousins is back. Uh, Cousins, Cousins returned to practice yesterday. Funny, we didn't get a chance to um, be at practice yesterday. So... You know, we couldn't necessarily have an update, but Kirk is also expected to talk this week uh, before the game. Not really mm -hmm. sure what his status is just yet for the preseason uh, home opener, but I, I would hope that this coaching staff um, expects him to be out there if he can. It's always really tough with this COVID thing because you just don't really know how a player is going to respond. You know, he's coming back playing a pretty high contact sport, you know, a, a sport where, you know, sometimes the cardio can leave you a little bit winded and then you're coming from COVID as well, which doesn't help matters as far as like lung capacity goes. You know, I've had it. It's not fun. <laughs> you know, after after a workout, you notice maybe you're, you're, you're huffing and puffing just a little bit more. You know, I think the hope is, is that Cousins got it twice before and hopefully this time, you know, he was able to rebound a little bit faster from it. Um, you know, going home from practice on Thursday. Uh, yeah, it was Thursday, um, not feeling well and all that stuff. And so I think you hope that he is okay. You hope that maybe he can get a couple practices in before this uh, game this weekend, and maybe he can, you know, go out there, play a couple series, and, 
and get his feet wet and into this new system. But he is back. Kevin uh, Seifert uh, reported yesterday from ESPN back at the facility, five days in isolation after he felt ill on Thursday. And uh, team is going to practice today. No update, no word on if he's going to actually be out there giving it a full go yet. But we'll see uh, when it comes to practice time, when it starts. Great to have him back. Got to find the positives, though. Obviously, great to have him back. But if he can't go a full 100%, like you mentioned, you don't know how he's going to respond when he gets on the actual field right away. Maybe the stamina isn't there yet. Huge opportunity again for Kellen Mond to get more reps against a new opponent. So hopefully that helps him and his development even more so seeing real reps against first and second team defenses this time around. Last one real quick, speaking of joint practices, we got into a little bit yesterday, but give me the one thing you're most looking forward to seeing these next few days against the 49ers. I think I, I just want to see the competition, you know, see how they go out there and compete. And, you know, see how they mix it up. You know, it's funny when these teams come um, to practice against the other. Usually, they're, it depends on if there's, like, a game or not, how, like, intense it is. Like, these, both of these teams have had a game under their belt. So, there's not that necessarily, like, uh, pent-up, you know, aggression and tension and all that stuff. Hey, we've been hitting each other. We're ready to hit somebody else, you know. Um, they they both have had a, a preseason game between them to kind of get a little bit of that out of the system. But I think it's going to be fun, you know. Both of these teams have two younger head coaches, uh, two fiery guys, uh, two teams that are hungry, trying to, trying to do something. You know, the 49ers were just in the Super Bowl a couple seasons ago. You know, the Vikings are trying to get there. And, you know, you got some new wrinkles on this 49ers team, new quarterback. I'm excited to see, you know, what all they employ on this Vikings defense to get after Trey Lance and make things a little bit difficult for him. This is probably going to be one of the more aggressive defenses that he'll see so far in his young career. And I'm I'm looking forward to how they mix it up and make things kind of rough for him, kind of confusing for him out there. See some wrinkles in, in Ed Donatel's defense that maybe we didn't see so far. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing how the offense performs against this 49ers defense as well. And just some of the individual matchups, you know, some of the rookies like this, this is another opportunity for them. Guys like Lewis Seen, Andrew Booth Jr., Ed Ingram to have, you know, a, another look against another team. And, and also it's helpful that they see this team for a couple of days before they play the game, play the real thing on Saturday. You know, just to kind of get some of those, you know, pregame jitters out, if you will. You know, it's going to be the first time some of these rookies are playing in front of the fans uh, at home. And so that's going to give a different level of energy. So it's going to be good that they've kind of seen this team already and they can kind of prepare mentally a little bit differently than just seeing them cold. Yeah, a lot of good points there, Reg. I don't know a lot, but I do know this. Things are going to get feisty out there. Reggie, you mm -hmm. weren't around during the Laquan Treadwell days, but Quan was known for picking fights and starting the scrums mm. almost every day. It was almost a given. Death, taxes, and Laquan Treadwell picking a fight in training camp. And you okay. got to remember this, too. These guys just saw five of their buddies, their teammates, get cut. Things just got very real for a lot of these guys. Survivor style. They head back to the locker room, the island, team meetings. The guy you're used to sitting next to, he's gone. Hand in your torch. There's a huge difference between making the team as a UDFA and making the final 53 when it comes to your paycheck. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars here. So now you bring in another team, another full roster of guys fighting for their livelihood, trying to put food on the table. I expect things to get very chippy and feisty and a few scrums to break out at some point. And if I had to put money on one guy, I'm thinking... Andrew Booth Jr., you already mentioned him yep. earlier in the show. Could be a guy yep. to start John a little bit too much at the wrong guy at the wrong time. Lid pops yep. off. All of a sudden, it goes from barking at one another to throwing punches real quick. So expect to see the intensity, though, to be at an all-time high from what we've seen at training camp thus far. Trust me, I think this next two days versus the Niners at practice will be far more entertaining than, say, the night scrimmage that took place a week or so ago. I guarantee that. Vikings' latest odds to win the Lombardi 
Series sits at 25 to 1. You can check it all out on Bet Online. Bet Online, your number one source for all your betting needs, stats, news, and info. Bet Online makes betting easy. Go to betonline.net today to learn more. That's betonline.net where the game starts. We want to know from you who you're most excited to see when San Francisco comes to town. Go comment on the YouTube channel. Let us know what you think. 21 days, three weeks until week one of the NFL season kicks off. Rest assured, Reggie and I got you covered every step of the way every day on Locked On Sports Minnesota, which you can now find streaming on your Roku device. So be sure to look up our Locked On Sports Minnesota app there as well. Pretty cool. All right, to baseball we go. And I swear, Reggie, people were almost daring the Twins to lose as of late, saying, let's go, put us <laughs> out of our misery. Yeah, you got one versus a bad team in the Royals, but I dare you to make it two in a row. Well, sure enough, typical Twins fashion. Twins come out with what I think you have to call a pretty flawless game top to bottom. No runs allowed. Sonny Gray puts on the master class. Six inning, 10 Ks, no earned. Bullpen does Sheesh. the same. And the bats, Reggie, my goodness. How many two, three, four run games have they had over the last three weeks or so? First time in 19 games they score more than eight runs. Remember, this is kind of what we expected to see at the beginning of the year as a whole. A lot of double-digit, kind of 10-7 to seven type of games from them after what we saw last year. Hasn't been the case, but... Last night, they put up nine runs thanks to some timely hitting. Six of 18 with runners in scoring position and a total team effort, too. This wasn't just one guy or two. Urshela and Gordon, two RBIs, and then five other batters with a run batted in. You love to see it. Reggie, more impressive last night, the pitching or the hitting, in your opinion? Oh, without a doubt, the hitting, you know, because the pitching is what we expected like to be better especially after the arms that they got at the deadline but the bats all of a sudden was just like oh okay we the, the pitching's cool we don't have to do much and it's just like wait 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 no 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 keep that same energy let's let's keep it up because like these games are important here and it's funny because like you know sometimes it does just take playing a bad team to just kind of get back on the saddle a little bit more you got 16 hits last night 13 singles like where did this come from? Holy offensive production from the bats, Batman. Like, that's just kind of crazy that that all of a sudden, you know, things just clicked. And, you know, that seventh, eighth inning, it was just like run after run after run. It's just like, dang, twins, beat them down then. Beat them down. And so, look, it's like coming into this series, it's like I dare you to sweep them. I dare you. I double dog dare you to sweep them. And now they put themselves in position to do it. And this is the type of series that gives you momentum going into a, a weekend series, a four game set with the, the Rangers and then having teams that look, these are teams that are some of what you might consider the upper echelon of teams with the Giants, the Red Sox, the Astros. And it's just like, look, if they can strike fire here, especially with these games being at home and they can all of a sudden just string some together, maybe, maybe only a couple losses in this, in this stretch of home games. And then you go on the road uh, to Houston and you're just like cooking with gas. Like, I don't know, man, like that, that could be a good recipe. They're only a game back now in the division. Like all of a sudden the team that looked like, you know, it was time to leave them for dead. All of a sudden they're up like the undertaker you know, in a, 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 a steel cage match. And now all of a sudden they're, they're, they're ready to come out and swing. And like, if they're, they're going to keep this production up with the bats, watch out. I am so impressed with Thielbar. Like the dude mm. came in last night in a jam. Sonny kind of, you know, left him in a little bit of a jam. And he was money, man. Got the, got the ground out and then two straight strikeouts to end the inning. Like, got out of there and that was like the biggest threat that they had all game and they took care of business like it takes sometimes a bad team to come into your house for you to realize like okay we're good we got to pick this up we got to make things count let's do this and 16 hits later i would say they they've broken through you know their their slump they came into the week 0 for 18 with runners in scoring position that changed quickly in a major way. 
Yeah, felt like Twins pounded down some Built Bars yesterday in the clubhouse before the first <laughs> pitch after that performance. Built Bar, it's made with collagen protein, so it's easily digestible, provides tons of health benefits. You got to eat something that tastes good and is good for you. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15. Saturday night when they blew that game versus the Angels, Thielbar came in, and I was screaming at my TV because he pitched a flawless inning, 10 pitches, two strikeouts. And I was mm-hmm. saying, Rocco, you got to leave him in for one more, man, because Thielbar, you're yeah. right. I'm glad you highlighted him and singled him out. He's been red hot, man. So nice man. to lean on a third guy after Duran and Lopez. And know you got that middle inning reliever that can chew up maybe in an inning or two with Thielbar. Mm-hmm. So that feels good. Maybe sometimes this is exactly what you need. You're right. This is the recipe for success, playing a couple below average teams to get a little bit of that swag, that confidence back, and then play it at home. Yeah. Twins double dip last night with a win and Cleveland lost to Detroit of all teams, moved to just one game back from the division league just like that. Let's Remember go. Twins with a nice little home stretch here. One more versus the Royals, then four-game homestand, as Reggie mentioned, versus the Rangers this weekend. Pivotal stretch up on the horizon. Tyler Malley on the mound today in an afternoon start. First pitch, 12-10 p.m. Central Standard Time. Rest assured, we got you covered tomorrow to break it all down. All right, time has come. My favorite segments here. I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean, covering all the latest hot topics in Minnesota sports. First up. Mike Zimmer's back in the news again after it has been reported he will reunite with his former disciple Deion Sanders to help coach Jackson State. What does it mean for Zimmer and his impact on the collegiate program and his possible path back to coaching in the NFL someday down the road? He's been quiet for a while, Reg. He finally busts out of his shell. We knew he couldn't sit down at that ranch for too long. He was just inching, knee bouncing up and down. He's got to be in the football game some way, shape, or Form. Glad to see him back. What does this mean, though, for the future of Mike Zimmer? So, look, he's been at his ranch back in uh, northern Kentucky and probably just recharging a little bit of a respite. You know, it's been a long eight years, a stressful eight years, whatever you want to call it. You know, last week he ended up at Bengals practice, just kind of checking it out. You know, his son works on the staff, so he was like, oh, let me just see what's up. And what's funny is, is I thought that maybe Zach Taylor would have brought him on as maybe kind of like a defensive analyst or, you know, just another, you know, guy that that can, you know, be another voice uh, in that coaching room. But <laughs> as it turns out, he's going to go down with his friend Dion. So, like, what's funny is, is like, I saw some of the most curmudgeon of Mike Zimmer and it mostly happened when Chris Thomason was asking him questions. <laughs> Absolutely. But then, but then, you know, I saw the most giddy Mike Zimmer in a press conference when Deion Sanders called him in the middle of a, of a Zoom press conference. And he just got absolutely giddy talking to Deion Sanders. The two of them just love each other. You know, back in the 90s when they were with the Cowboys, they won a Super Bowl together. It was, you know, just love. It's been love ever since. It's nothing but good vibes. I think this is going to be good for Mike Zimmer. Just a chance to kind of get back to his roots a little bit. Came up, you know, I'm I'm a Mizzou guy. Mike Zimmer came up, started at Mizzou, you know, mm-hmm. with, with some of his uh, college coaching endeavors. And so now he's getting back to college coaching. You know, it's funny when he left Minnesota, so many of the players either alluded to or flat out said, like, just the whole, like, culture of fear type situation that, that was, like, pretty much clouding the program just really didn't sit well with them. And they they just kind of got like bogged down by it. I think this is going to be a good challenge for Zimmer just to kind of get re-energized a bit, get under some guys that are young, they're hungry, they're trying to like do something like he can teach, help teach the game to, you know, Deion Sanders is one of those kind of like players, coaches, you know, very energetic guys that that really just kind of like you know pulls the energy out of his football team guys really enjoy playing for him probably you know keeps it light but but also discipline running around out there having fun 
that's something that I don't know if Zimmer's really been around for a while. And, you know, now that he's not the guy, you know, leading the charge, he's just kind of one of the guys. I can see where maybe something like this can just kind of help just kind of change the mindset a little bit, maybe give him a different perspective that maybe, you know, when another NFL coaching job comes along down the line, whether it's, you know, him being a defensive coordinator again or him, you know, being DBs, linebackers coach, whatever the case may be, maybe he changes that perspective a little bit. Maybe this gives him a little different, you know, look at how he can go about things. And I can only see this as being helpful for him as he continues his coaching career. Yeah, Zimmer's definitely not one for fluff, right? He's that old school, hard-nosed, Parcell-style coach, pretty stingy mm -hmm. when it comes to handing out praise. It's going to be interesting to see whether Dion steers Zimmer away from that style now that he's coaching some younger kids in college, or whether they'll do like that good cop, bad cop thing when players need some tough love. <laughs> All right, next one up, what does it mean? Twins first-round pick Brooks Lee? He's already making waves and headlines, and he's now catapulted up to the team's number one prospect after just a month and a half of play. Remember, he was regarded as a top three, if not number one overall pick there for a while in those mock drafts. Shocking to see him fall in the Twins' lap all the way at number eight. He was kind of labeled as a very prospect ready, ready to come in and not have to sit in the minors for four or five years. Pretty polished, maybe not high ceiling as some of the other guys like Andrew Jones, but very polished. What does it mean for the Twins' future at the shortstop position? And is there a chance we could see Lee in the lineup as early as next year? I'm okay. telling you, Reg. All right. Cut it out. Cut it out, man. He's just a prospect. There's no way he's coming up that soon. Now, what I will say, though, is maybe, you know, he hits so well. Maybe you catapult him up a couple times. Like, you know, I can see him going, you know, low ball, low A ball to high A ball, maybe – you know, double A, maybe he gets up to double A by next season, something like that, just to give him a little bit more competition, challenge him a little bit more, and, and just kind of get him ready. There's no rush on this guy, which is the, the good part about it. You know, we'll see how Royce Lewis comes back in his lateral quickness side to side um, after yet another ACL injury, because he was the guy that was looked at as like the shortstop of the future. And he had been tearing it up so much. They're like, man, we just got to put this guy in somewhere, put him in the outfield, and we see how that worked out. He wasn't bad out there, but, you know, that the injury happened. It was tough. But you got Correa there now. Don't really know what his future is. And you got Royce Lewis coming back from another knee injury, and you're like, okay, maybe we'll see what happens there. But I think it's so nice that you have a guy like Brooks Lee coming up through the ranks and – already making a major impact in the organization you just kind of finesse him up see how he goes see how he progresses and you know maybe three or four years or something like that maybe you can bring him up and and he can actually be a, a high impact high impact player you know along the lines of maybe like a, a Dansby Swanson or something like that in in Atlanta um he tore it up and the minors before they finally just were like, all right, we can't, you know, we can't keep them down for long. Let's bring them up. You know, you, I don't think you'll see a situation like a Chris Bryant, you know, where they're just keeping them down, keeping them down, keeping them down just for the sake of it, you know, for the uh, years of control or, you know, something like that. But I think it is promising that he's already starting to show a lot of promise, you know, in only just months in the organization. But still, you know, it, College, professional, it's a different beast. I want to see him, you know, against some some double A competition. And then maybe we can talk. Then maybe we can see about getting him up to St. Paul. But I still think he's a few years away. Here's the thing you got to remember. Without Lee and Royce Lewis this year, the Twins are the second youngest team in the MLB right now. That's something that we just don't talk about as a fan base and a culture when we talk about the Twins trying to make this playoff push here. They're the second youngest team in the MLB right now without Lee and Lewis this year. So eventually mm -hmm. when Lee does get in the lineup, he's only 21 right now. Alex Kirilov, 24 years old. Royce Lewis, 23. Jose Miranda, who's 
clearly developed into his own here is going to be a core piece of this lineup. He's only 24. And then you got your vets, the heart of the order. Buxton's only 28, Polanco's 29, and Luis Rice just 25 years old. So the future looks bright no matter what happens the rest of this year. Hopefully, obviously, they can clinch this division. But the future looks bright in Minnesota when you look at that young corn foundation that they're going to be able to build off of. All right. That's a wrap today. We're back here tomorrow breaking down more Twins, Vikings, and plenty more. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. We're a podcast, too, free and available on all platforms. Subscribe, drop us a five-star review, and take us everywhere on the go. That's Reggie Wilson. Follow him on Twitter, at Reggie Wilson TV, and on CARE 11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter, at Luke underscore Spinman. Special thanks to our producer, Matt DeBritt. Tune in tomorrow to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing off. Be blessed. Spread love today.